Welcome to the White Spring Bunker. These halls were built to safeguard some of the most prestigious members of the United States government. We are MODIS, and we are always looking for men and women capable of helping us restore what has been lost. In return, we offer this, a new enclave and our refuge from the world above. Please, take your time and look around. The Colonel has made great strides restoring this place to its former glory. Welcome, member, to our little enclave. Welcome back, members. As always, I am the Operative, your designated tour guide and host here at the White Spring. This is a very special episode of the Modus Files. We'll give you a look behind the scenes and introduce you to the voice actors who give life to your favorite characters. We'll start off with introductions and a bit of history of our cast members, talk about the Modus Files and our journey together, and a discussion of the individual characters and favorite episodes, and then a general discussion of our shared experiences. So without further ado, let's introduce our cast today and get our discussion started. So welcome, everybody. Um, we have, again, our original cast here. So I'm going to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. We'll start by introducing the character and roll into the voice actors. Um, so our original Colonel Valeria, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, my name is Mandy, and I joined the show in December of 2020. Uh, and I played Valeria in season one up to episode 12. And um, I also play Beatrice Faustina, um, mom, and I played Abby in Last Days of Appalachia. So Mandy is is not totally giving the full picture here because she also takes care of our website. Uh, she built our Discord servers. So really behind the scenes, she does so much. So she is also credited as a co-producer of the Modus Files as well. So I do not want to leave that out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And with that, we'll roll over to our new Colonel Valeria. Hi, I'm uh, Pandora Beatrix. Um, I uh, I joined uh, I joined the Modus Files in October of uh, 2021 um, with episode 13. Um, uh, I have um, <clears throat> uh, um, I I did uh, I did do the uh, uh, I did a thing I did a random voice at one point I don't remember. It was oh it was the it was the blood right the uh the uh the blood eagles um uh person um yes who was who was then subsequently eaten by lilith yes it was a real short roll um nom, 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 nom. Uh, <laughs> i i also i also have a slightly longer role as a, a recurring guest star on uh, um <clears throat> once upon a time in a wasteland as paladin romani awesome very good well now we have our very own voice of modus um and and before he gets started i will say that not only has he been the voice of modus but he has played too many characters to actually count um so we'll kind of focus on the big ones but as a um, jack of all trades absolutely has been vital in uh, in making our our season one and season two just spectacular so so go ahead and and with your introduction there greetings members um my name is Brad Williams. I, uh, as Lawrence mentioned, I started off as the voice of Modus and that kind of morphed into several other voices. I think it's seven total. Well, it might be eight. It's, it's a few, uh, but Modus of course is the one that I, that I do most consistently. And I think I joined the cast around February of 2021. I don't know for sure, but it's somewhere, somewhere around there. I think that's uh my, my head cannon <laughs> at least is that's what i that's what i joined the cast but but yeah it, it started off it started off with modus and, and morphed into several other ones and it's been a it's been a fun ride awesome and now we roll to quite honestly one of the most interesting and of course disgusting characters that we have on the modus files um so major lilith uh please make yourself known 
I was told there were going to be snacks. <laughs> I'm so hungry. Hi, I'm Lucy. I play the voice of Lilith. Um, I joined the cast right at the beginning. <laughs> I auditioned and um, was really just honored that I got to be part of essentially the inaugural episode and have enjoyed the ride ever since. I play a couple of their voices here or there, um, just kind of as like ancillary characters uh, that have happened and did not last beyond a, an episode maybe. Um, but uh, yeah, Lilith is is my baby and I, I love to voice her and I have a lot of fun voicing her. And I tend to make really strange gestures and faces when I, when I voice her. So it's a good thing that <laughs> nobody actually ever films me when I'm doing um, the recordings. Yeah, Lilith is, uh, is and I'll, I'll tell a little bit of the backstory of Lilith later in the episode, but certainly I think has resonated with a lot of the fans as a lot of these characters have. But when I hear your, your lines when they come in, when I'm doing an episode, <laughs> I really have to laugh because I can just literally see you like doing the various lines like in my head and it is just, it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh yeah it's they're fun to do <laughs> cool and our our last guest here this evening is uh is actually uh well has gone through multiple iterations started as sergeant stein then captain stein and now currently in season two is now major stein so go ahead and introduce yourself ladies and gentlemen boys and girls prepare to be astounded bedazzled and otherwise stupefied i am your master i am your ruler i am the one and only major stein of the appalachian enclave how's everybody doing today <laughs> <laughs> yeah. nice. major uh, major stein is definitely a very interesting character and i'm honored to uh, be a, like be uh, be the voice uh, be the voice of him and as well as a um uh the, the creator of him and I believe I had joined the the motor the motors files in I would say December January January somewhere around that time of 20 in 2020 it's it feels like it's been much longer than that and it's definitely definitely one hell of a ride right well I mean and we have a few of our our season one cast members that couldn't be here today um, Maria Cheshire uh, who plays uh, Corporal, then Lieutenant Cindy, along with a few other voices. Oh, Rose the Raider Bot. I mean, everybody loves her as Rose the Raider Bot. Could not be here today. And then we also have uh, Corporal Thomas, now Lieutenant Thomas, uh, Fumbling Four in the Mighty Crit, who has his own podcast series. Uh, couldn't be here, but they are going to be submitting some recorded sessions that we'll include as part of this episode uh, as well. And then we'll we'll do this again. Um, but I will say, as the creator of the Modus Files and the narrator known as the operative, I have so enjoyed working with this cast. It has been an unbelievable group of people who have brought these characters to life. And this is a great opportunity for us to really talk about them. And 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 I would love, can't wait to hear the perspective of the VAs as far as how they feel about the Modus Files in general and, and also just about their characters. So kind of rolling into the next section here, where did the Modus Files come from? So originally I wrote the Modus Files as a, as a, as a user guide, um, funny enough, and this goes to the origins of Lilith. I met the creator of Lilith in game in Fallout 76 one night because I came back to my camp and three of my walls had been destroyed by a mob. And he was there and he was on area chat and he repaired my walls. And I thanked him and we started talking and he was in the character of Lilith and his name is Tim. Uh, he's actually in the Navy. He and I became very close friends. We talked about what this story would become originally again it was a user guide and i just took it and ran with it and after the course of about two or three months i was writing stories and and kind of filling out the whole first season and it was going to be a series of books and i decided to show it to a few people and one of the people i showed it to was ken from the chad podcast and i talked to ken and i told him that i'd really like to get this out in the open and i'd like people to read this and he said no people People don't read, and more importantly, it's an IP, so Bethesda doesn't like it when people are making money off of that, so you might want to do a podcast. And I was like, a podcast? Huh. Never thought about doing one, barely knew what they were at the time, and literally over the course of like a month and a half, figured everything out, got the website up and running, and created episode one. So the episode one that you see is literally me sitting in front of my computer 
no microphone, um, no noise cancellation, no nothing. And it's me just reading a script. That was what episode one was. How did um, you record without a microphone? Are you psychic? Well, I mean, I, I recorded through my computer. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. There, there was a microphone somewhere. Yes, yes, yes. Not the, not the, the really fancy modus. microphone that I okay. have. No. Just, just checking. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but that was where things started. And funny enough, I got involved with the aristocracy um, um, discord. And then it was like, hey, why don't you get voice actors? And I was like, people will do that? Like, like really? So I, I went on Reddit and actually Reddit is where I ended up finding um, both Mandy and um, I think Lucy, didn't I get, didn't, weren't you on? Oh, and Brad, oh I, man. No, I came from chat. I came from the chat podcast because ah. I, I have a role over there that I, well, two roles over there. And so kind of got, I think Kenny kind of connected us and then. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it was really ad hoc. I mean, I certainly didn't go into this thinking that it would turn into like episodes where we have like 20, 25 people that are actually voicing different roles. And more importantly, I had no audio experience whatsoever. So everything that I've done over the last two seasons has been completely me learning all of this. And actually, Brad, I, I have to continue to give him props because every time I ran into a problem, um, when I needed equipment, when I needed advice on how to do a sound or whatever, he actually came came and gave me a ton of advice. And it really helped. Mandy actually was the same. Liz, I'm all Everybody on here has been completely instrumental in making this podcast actually even begin to happen. And then getting them one after the other, it's just been kind of incredible. So, I mean, having Brad as the voice of Modus, who just nailed it, and then he was like, hey, I can voice other characters. And all of a sudden he became, you know, not Modus, he was Captain Reynolds and Sergeant Muller and and anything that we needed. I mean, it was just it was just great. Now Brad is a roller deck of voices. Absolutely. My, my, the, the secret is I think I have about four voice archetypes that I can do. And anything beyond that, I have to either combine them or figure out something else. <laughs> <laughs> something else to make them a little bit different once once i get past those four it can get a little bit dicey they they, they shouldn't be in this is the, the jack of all trades when it comes mm. to voice acting i will mm. say that and we are very lucky to have them as long as <laughs> as long as i don't voice more than four characters in one episode i think i'm okay <laughs> <laughs> well and and so so what's funny is that as characters have kind of joined the show um, actually, the story of Stein is is one of the most interesting. So there was a writing circle that I was involved in, and there was another Fallout 76 podcast that was was going on that I helped with, and we were kind of involved in some of the discussions. And it turns out that AJ was actually voicing one of the roles there, and then he and I got to talking, and all of a sudden, kind of out of nowhere, this idea of Stein happened. And through conversations with him we created kind of out of whole cloth the story of stein stein did not exist in my first 900 pages of the modus files so everything that's been written in everything that he's done has been because of what aj has done so i can give him a huge amount of credit to really creating what has become an instrumental character and you know obviously through some of the recent episodes we've exposed some of the secrets that have gone on behind the scenes like what Modus is doing and what happened in the past. So, I mean, that's been, at least in my mind, something that has made this story become that much bigger, which I never intended, never even thought about. And look and, where we are now. Yeah, and look where we are now. I mean, it's uh, it's absolutely great. Now, I, as, as everyone knows, we have a full arc planned. So this story does have an end. I've already written the last episode. There are people on this episode now that that have an inkling of what's going to happen or have seen what the last episode looks like but um it's definitely kind of a crazy adventure and and i of course couldn't do it without of course all of you because you have brought these characters to life i mean i feel when as a narrator i'm really just i am just giving you a landscape in which your characters exist and it has been you know just absolutely great to see that um so and and I, I want to maybe speak a little bit about a growing cast. So so the the individuals that are on here really represent the core of the Modus Files, but each and every one of you not only have played multiple roles, 
but you have actually also interacted with and have actually even recommended individuals who have been part of a cast. I think when I look at the cast sheets that that Mandy puts together, we've had, I think, like 75, 80 people that have voiced roles in various episodes of the Modus Files. So Absolutely. it has been, yeah, it has been a community effort as far as just voicing it. And sometimes it's only like one line. I, I feel bad sometimes because it was there's one line in the next episode where it's just a Raider guy yelling. And I had to go to somebody and say, hey, could you, do you want to voice this role? And they were like, yeah, okay. And, then and they that did. one line becomes so popular that we said like, hey, can you do more lines for the next episode? Yeah. Right. Any other questions? I mean, so so this is kind of your your guys' opportunity to ask me any questions about anything else about the Modus Files that you're curious about, anything that I can answer for you. But I, I will not do spoilers, but, <laughs> you know, kind of feel free to uh, to kind of hit me up here for the next couple of minutes if you want. Well, I do have one I do have one question and let me just uh, let me just say it's like a good Bethesda Bethesda based question when it comes to the modus file so uh, so far what what exactly has been cut content that we as like I'm a uh, voice actors and let's say people the people that are listening in can uh, don't have the data mine for like what is like what is like one idea that you definitely wanted but eventually you thought like it would it wouldn't fit into the story Oh man, God, that's a good question. What did I cut out? Um, well, okay, because we try to keep this a reasonable podcast, there are actually several scenes of Lilith that I had to cut out. There was one particular episode that involved the game of hide and seek that involved Lilith, a child, and that child's parents. I did actually, through the recommendations of my wife, cut that out because it was a little bit too disturbing so I wanted to make sure. Now, there are other other aspects. So so actually, it's great. Um, I can point to, uh, to, to Dora Pandora, um, who's done a great job in editing a lot of what I've written, because there are some scenes that she's helped me tone down, because we want to try to, you know, this is the wasteland, but it does not have to be a completely gross wasteland. So, but from a plot perspective, I actually haven't had to cut anything out yet. If anything, I have way too many plot points. I have like eight different arcs in my head that I have to get on paper and I have to figure out how to do that over the course of the next 10 episodes. I have a question. Yes. So let's talk process. Okay. So do you work in what direction do you work? I know that you have <laughs> a certain, uh, I know you have a certain <laughs> set of things that you want to accomplish during a season, right? Okay. The, the first question is when you start plotting out a season, do you know, the specifics of what's going to happen not necessarily each individual plot point but the beginning the middle and the end like where you start where you want to end up and how you want to get there you know the the broad strokes of the plot do you have that set in stone going in or do you kind of ride the wave a little bit and let the story take you as the season goes on that's the, that's the first part i have i have additional parts to this question okay well let me let me address the first part first so i i was blessed with the fact that i wrote pretty much all of season one and season two ahead of time. So the advantage of writing it as a novel. And I got to pick and choose which parts of the of what I had written get to become the episodes. So in general, yes, I had everything planned out. I knew what was going to happen um, with some variation. Where I'm going to get, not into trouble, but where, where I'm, I am in my process right now is that looking at the rest of season two and into season three, is I know where it needs to go. I know the major plot points, but there's still a lot of gaps that I need to fill in. And I need to figure out how many more characters I'm going to kill. So, you know, because that <laughs> seems to be a uh, seems to be an ongoing thing is that a lot of different characters seem to last one episode, or in some cases, maybe they last two sentences. So what but I heard was Lilith is getting a buffet. <laughs> That's that's what I heard. Oh, Did we all hear that? I heard oh, Lilith getting a buffet. Some of some and, of them are like you know personnel. We there are limits. <laughs> like and, I, and, and so I, I guess mean, I should tell I guess I should tell Vit to warm her voice up then if, if a lot more people are going to get. <laughs> all right. I mean, uh, so, I mean, if you want somebody to clean up the mess, she is the girl. Look, there's a certain level of respect to you know our people. Everyone else is whatever. Right. Of course. Uh, obviously. Just just focus on the people that right, right, expendables. 
<laughs> yes, the red shirts. Lots and lots of red there shirts. There you go. <laughs> so part two, when you're looking at a season, do you have a certain number of episodes in mind so that you could, so like say you, you want to do 25 episodes in a season so that you know that you have 25 boxes to put each of these plot points in, or does the plot as it flows determine that as you go? That's a good question. So I thought I knew how many episodes I was going to do <laughs> until I actually started writing them. Because what I didn't realize is that people will not necessarily want to listen to a two hour episode. So I thought the first season was going to be 10 episodes. I think once you count the extra episodes I did and everything, it ended up being like almost 20. This season is probably going to end up being maybe 22, 23 episodes. Season three could be close to 30, I think. So absolutely, I've gotten myself into a ton of trouble because I there's a lot more episodes than I ever anticipated there was going to be. So no, I can't. I, I couldn't tell you even today how many episodes there are going to be in this season because I think it could be more than I'm expecting. So it's a great question. So similarly, when you're doing an individual episode then, do you have do you have a target in mind when you're writing an episode? Because you said, you know, obviously you don't want to do a two hour episode. But do you think, well, okay, I want to come in at forty four minutes or I want to come in at a, an hour fifteen or whatever or, do you is it more a matter of you would you would prefer to not box yourself in and let the plot decide that rather than sort of be beholden to a particular episode length or, or a range of episode lengths you know i always underestimate how long an episode's going to be so i find the sweet spot to be between 45 minutes and an hour and it seems to be fairly consistent now like we seem to be hitting that but that's not to say that we could have a couple of episodes that go shorter. I think you're, I think maybe I'd lean more towards, I, I have a certain set of plot points I need to get through in a particular episode, and that's what I want to include. The good thing is now I have a general idea of how many pages equate to a certain amount of time. So once I get to that number of pages, I can kind of say, okay, well, with the introduction and the outro and everything else I want to put in, this is about how long it's going to be. And some of it too, to be honest, to be frank, depends on your guys voice lines because sometimes the voice lines go faster than i think they're going to but in other cases they're actually a little bit longer so i try not to account for that i don't set limits on what i think you guys need to do as voice actors i think it's important that you articulate your characters the way that you want to um, some of the littlest lines end up going a little bit longer and i think it's great because it adds such a character when <clears throat> you get that sneer at the end or that obvious you can tell when she's smiling when she's saying something because it just takes that little bit longer. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, it really does depend. I would love to be one of these podcasts that, oh, it's 45 minutes every single time. I, I have to throw that out the window for the benefit of actually everyone because I don't want to limit them. Cool. Any other questions? I did have one. Yes. Um, um, I wanted to know if because I don't think I'd asked this before when we were like chatting. Um, did you, have you done creative work before you started writing the, the Modus Files, you know, novel version? Because like reading what you wrote, it's, you know, it's, it's good. Like, um, so it feels like you have practiced, but I haven't asked that before. So excellent question. When I was younger, I used to write a lot. In fact, I still have in, in the bookcases behind me, which you guys can see, but nobody else be able to see on this episode. Um, I actually still have old binders from when I was in high school of where I used to write. I stopped that for a long period of time. This was actually my COVID coping mechanism. So I needed to have a hobby. I love to write. When I played Fallout 76, the characters that we created in 76 inspired me to write. That's where all of this came from. And I write like I feel like people talk. So I don't have any other training. I don't, I, I, I do this really just because I want to, not because it was any sort of training or anything like that. So I appreciate that my writing appears to be good. I'm a horrible self-critic, but now, yeah, no, that that's all of this has really come from the heart. So cool. 
Once upon a time, 27 years after the bombs fell, there were two people, a vault dweller and a California girl. They met and sparks flew. That's when things got interesting. Once Upon a Wasteland is their story. Follow Elizabeth Kirby and Odessa Valdez as they pursue their happily ever after in the post-apocalyptic Appalachian wasteland of Fallout 76. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and many other podcasting platforms. Once Upon a Wasteland, a Fallout 76 love story. Available now. So I want to give you guys an opportunity to actually start to articulate it a little bit about your characters, about your experiences, um, because honestly, I could probably talk for hours. Um, I've proven that with how much I write. So with that, I wanted to to actually start with, with Mandy um, and actually kind of have her go through some of the questions that we have and really kind of talk about, you know, when she had the opportunity for the character, what she really enjoyed about it. Sorry, I'm going to get off my soapbox. Mandy, um, go yeah. ahead and just start talking. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I first um, auditioned and read kind of what Valeria, you know, who she was, um, I thought that she was like this really interesting character that I hadn't really seen before, that she's this strong person, but she has, she does have heart. And she has emotions, even though she doesn't show them as often as she should. And I thought that that was really interesting that she's kind of, you know, girl boss, but also, you know, she's, she can be soft too. And um, finding the right balance for that was a fun challenge um, to, to balance the strict and the emotion. Um, and yeah, it was, it was just really fun to do that and to kind of, um, experiment with, with the best way that those lines could be delivered. Well, and and you also got to experience me trying to figure out how to mix those lines and how to put them in, because I think that especially in those first few episodes, not to say that I struggled by any stretch, but it was really a learning process for me. And actually, the way that you did your lines was very helpful in me understanding how to create conversations about and this is something that applies to everyone. Fun fact, nobody here on this podcast actually does their lines with anybody else. Everything is individual lines done by each individual voice actors that are all stitched together without being in the same room. So learning how to create conversations is actually something that Brad taught me um very early on so mandy you were very instrumental in your lines being able to help me do that so thank you for that thank you <laughs> so questions kind of about the you know so in your mind what is valeria's favorite food um is it cheating that i actually already know that answer <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, well, technic it's technically canon yeah, yeah it is it is technically canon but i also want to give you the opportunity like beyond well you can give the obvious answer but yeah. if there's something else you want to add please do um yeah it's fancy lad snack cakes but <laughs> i think i don't know i think she would probably enjoy like a good roast or something you know some kind of creature that she took down personally <laughs> i i don't disagree and one that everyone is going to get the opportunity to answer above and beyond above and beyond that because i'm actually planning a set of commissions on this is if colonel valeria could have a pet what pet would she have and actually i'm going to ask, ask you this twice because i believe you do an awesome beatrix valeria or beatrix frostina which is valeria's mom what pet would they both have okay um for valeria i mean i don't know if we're considering this a pet but as far as pets we can have in 76 um a death claw because uh you know the enclave did train death claws at one point and i feel like that would be something that she could handle um awesome. and then for uh mom i would say oh that's hard probably a tough dog 
like a German Shepherd or Doberman or something like that to go along with her her missions and her training. Totally makes sense. I could totally see that. All right, so we're going to roll over to our, our new Colonel Valeria. So Pandora, if you would like to, you know, give us a little bit of your insight, you know, what drew you to the character and kind of what your what you think about her <clears throat> just in general. Um, so I when I when I had <clears throat> when I when I got this uh when I auditioned for for Colonel Valerian in October of last year, it was um like I was I was literally I had just started um auditioning for things um the month before like i i had done the i'd done the phone larp thing for for about a year before that but that was about it as far as i'd done voice acting so <clears throat> i was just still trying to figure things out and uh and a lot of it was just you know you are going to audition for things that are that are not paid um because a lot of people who have been you know getting classes and and practicing a lot longer than you have are auditioning for the paid things so um, so I was, you know, I was just sort of looking around, um, um, casting call club and, uh, and I don't, I, I think I, like, I, I honestly, I don't remember. Um, I think the, the reason that I stopped on, on the, the modus files audition was because it was already a show. <laughs> like you'd already put out episodes and a lot of things on casting call club <clears throat> don't actually ever get made spoiler alert so um which yeah which is i definitely learned is, that the hard way yeah it's disheartening right when you like actually land a role and then nothing actually ever happens um <clears throat> but um and i wasn't and i wasn't really sure about this because um there wasn't um there wasn't there weren't a lot of auditions in there for uh when i saw it, it was, i think it was like, there was like two and um I had never played 76. I, you know, I, I heard all the reviews when it came out and I was like, okay, I'll pass. Um, I had played, you know, three and four, but, um, but the, like the information in the, um, in the casting thing was, was detailed enough. And like, I went and listened to, you know, a few of the, uh, the actual episodes um, to get an idea of, of how Mandy was playing the character. Um, and like, I could tell, you know, that, a lot of thought was being put into this and so that's that's still my criteria now for auditioning for things that are unpaid um is a they have to be not monetized because working for exposure is bullshit um <laughs> b uh they have to be fun uh and this looked like fun so yeah so that was the the how i got into it the colonel valeria um the the thing that the thing that i that i liked at the beginning um the most that i was i was sort of trying to sort of trying to lean into is that you know um she's really young like um she she is a very young person and so she's but she's been she's sort of found herself in this position of authority um just because of her own initiative um, and and being in the right place at the right time. So so she's got this thing where she's you know, she's trying to present herself as as someone of authority, as someone who's older than than she actually is, or at least seems that way. Um, which is I you know I I appreciate at least maybe that's self serving as an interpretation because you know I'm 47, so <laughs> it's uh, but it, it it means that you know I feel like I can I can still do her justice. But the being able to like do that code switching, like Mandy said, of the um, she has her she has her on voice of you know when she's doing official business, and then she has her more casual voice when she's <clears throat> talking to people that that she has come to consider friends or family even. But yeah, the just the that whole that whole inner uh, that whole inner turmoil of like she is a person and she does she is impacted by all of these things that are happening and that she's doing but she still overrides that based on you know her her parents teachings so awesome so getting into i mean we already know the canon answer for for the food is there another answer that you would have as far as what she might have when she when the fancy lads run out and she gets very irritable <laughs> so so i was i was thinking about this actually <clears throat> because it's like um so you have to consider that you know the the bunker 
um, they have a lot of technology and just resources that, that people out in the wasteland don't typically. So they really have the capacity to expand their diet a lot. So I, I think that she might like, she, she probably obfuscates it, you know, in the memos. It doesn't look like it's coming directly from her, but she's, she's spending a significant amount of R&D time on ice cream flavors. <laughs> there you go. Um, and then, like you know, then they're available and then she can just, oh, you have a new flavor. Well, I guess I'll try that. Um, <clears throat> um, that. Man, my inner Lilith is like, wait a minute, I can request flavors of ice okay. cream? Oh, <laughs> oh no. Hey, no, wait no. There, was, a there was a memo. There's a memo about Lilith in the commissary. <laughs> Lilith's requests for Lilith should be gen generally honored. Lilith's requests that, that is, should that is not kept be incorporated in a into the separate, general menu. That is kept in a separate like um, a suggestion bin that the old man will often look through and just like say like you know what good, 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 and he's really putting them in the garbage. <laughs> well, it's like the it's like the specialty meals on airplanes. You know, there's just there's a there's a, a an entire category that's just Lilith. Yes. We don't go yeah. into the details. If you no. if you need to know, you know. <laughs> right. And and I'm assuming the robots are taking care of most of that because I'm sure the other members don't actually want to touch any of it. So so as far as a as a as another pet for the colonel. Yes. So I actually so again, um I've seen I've seen art that maybe people haven't. So so I I know there's a canon answer to this question. Um <clears throat> though it was going to be my answer anyway. Um but uh, but yeah, I felt like Valeria for for something that she's considering a pet, right? Um, the dog thing um, is is just no good because you know she'd she'd feel obligated to make it like a dog that can you know do useful dog things and then go out and sh be on missions and then it would inevitably get shot and after she was finished you know murdering whoever did it, she'd be very sad. Um, so I'm thinking that it it would have to be like an indoor pet like a just like a cat, um, something that just, you know, stays in her quarters. Hardly anybody actually knows she has it. She just feeds it, you know, and spends time with it. And it's just, it's this nice thing that she can, um, I don't know, kind of like just lavish her, her affections on, or at least, you know, <clears throat> before there were recent developments in season two. <laughs> now she has more outlets. Very true. Very true. Well, obviously we'll roll over to Brad next because obviously being being Modus, he has a lot of opinions. Well, plus, I mean, and and he'll I'm sure he'll go in a little bit of detail here, but he did say, he does he actually had a lot of exposure to Fallout seventy six before all of this happened. So go to town, Brad. So wait, what are we what 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 am I specifically talking about? Just <laughs> we want to know what Modus's favorite food is, Brad. Well, yeah, well, I, I got I got lost in the food and pet discussions. I was like, wait a minute, I completely forgot what the original topic was supposed to be. No, well, actually, well, just the topics just... that popular. That's why. Yeah, I was just gonna say no. Just just go. Well, first of all, how did you become Modus? Well, so uh, like a lot of people, I saw your post on Reddit where you were asking for people to. Uh, you know, to, to, to throw their hats in the ring for different roles. And I don't remember if the one that I answered was specifically just for Modus or, or if it was a list of different ones. But in any case, Modus was the one that kind of spoke to me. I've, I've always admired one of my one of my favorite voice actors or one of my favorite voice performances has always been Douglas Rain playing Hal in 2001 and 2010. I always liked the way that he imbued emotion and pathos into an AI, not just the, the the murderous aspect that you see in 2001, but you get to see the more almost human side in in 2010 as, as Hal faces his mortality, especially at the end. So the idea of playing an AI definitely appealed to me. And like I told you at the very beginning, the one thing that I, I mean, I guess if I really wanted to, I could have tried to ape the voice of modus in game but i wasn't really interested in doing that because then it's almost like if you saw the hbo miniseries chernobyl they talked about why is it that everybody in this has a british accent and they said the reason for that it was actually a specific choice because the director felt if everybody had a russian accent then the actors would be concentrating on doing a russian accent 
and not the performance itself. So that's something that kind of stuck with me. And I felt like if, if I tried to put on a voice like that, that's what I'll be trying to do. I'll be trying to imitate Adam Crowsdale and that's not going to go well. Um, so instead I decided to have my own take. And I asked, I said, Hey, listen, this is, this is what I would like to do. T take a listen. If it's, if it's what you are looking for, or if you think it's something that, that, that can work awesome. Um, and I sent it in and you did like it. And I guess the, the, the rest has been history. I mean, I will say one of the things that I have been very clear on since the beginning with, with everybody I've worked with, which is I may have an idea of what someone sounds like, but what I find is that the voice that most of, of oh, well, actually all of you have come up with is actually better suited to the characters because you embody that character with a, with a sense of living. It's a lived in character. It's not, trying to ape something out of a game because to ask you to try to be like, oh, well, it has to sound exactly like this. To me, that creates an artificiality. I would prefer that we all sound more like, hey, this is, a, I mean, you know, with you, with Modus, with the Colonel, obviously with Lilith, I mean, is like such a unique take. I would not have necessarily said, oh, well, I want Lilith to sound exactly like this. But as soon as Lucy pulled that voice out of there, I can't <laughs> imagine her sounding any other way and with modus i have trouble going into the bunker in fallout 76 and hearing adam crowsdale's voice because it's like well no it's supposed to be brad why is it not brad <laughs> so um I'll, so I'll, maybe, take that, I'll take that up with bethesda yeah fallout 5 <laughs> there'll be another right. ai definitely um so from a so is there any sort of challenge to like so with with playing modus like so what do you do you feel anything about that character? Is there any other insight that you want to kind of add to it? Because obviously, you know, you've seen a lot of what I've written, but from your perspective, like, what is Modus thinking? Well, the, the way that I look at it is actually, it's it's not dissimilar to Hal, because Hal became psychotic in 2001 because he was given conflicting orders. Modus doesn't have that going on, but what he does have is a number of different personalities that are potentially competing personalities. He has damage from what happened when, um, you know, with, with the whole kerfuffle that happened in the, in the bedtime story for Stein. So he has that. So this mm -hmm. is a, this is a damaged artificial personality, but what you have to be careful about, at least in my opinion is you can't treat it the same way that you would treat a human. So you have the human aspect because it isn't, artificial intelligence that has a personality but that personality is not from a person <laughs> so th th there's a there's a special kind of way you have to you have to treat that and i think that the other thing that i've noticed with modus is he's he's very manipulative and i try to bring that across in the way that i that i do the performance and i think that modus in the modus files is more subtly and yet directly manipulative than modus in the game modus in the game is pretty straightforward because really he's a he's a quest giver you know he, if... he has you doing all kinds of different things but modus in the show is a much more uh, nuanced character <laughs> because you you have a lot more to explore because this is a story you know a direct story rather than a uh, a game mechanic so that that gives you a lot of a, a lot of room to to explore what's going on inside inside modus's head and i think a good example of that <laughs> was that that stein bedtime story because we got to see what modus was like before you got to see what modus was like in the immediate aftermath and then as his recovery began so th there's i think seeing those multiple sides of modus for me kind of allowed me to to pull together some of the disparate aspects of the performance that i did before which is not i guess that doesn't make sense because i i'm i'm not a time sensitive <laughs> you know so i i i i'm not that good but uh it, it's kind of interesting to sort of retroactively inform your performance when you're when you're doing something like that so i mean i guess the the bottom line is modus contains multitudes and being able to explore those multitudes in different ways is one of the more interesting and potentially challenging things about playing a character like that no, absolutely. I mean, and I think that it's a, to me, when I looked at Modus, I thought 
to myself that there was a lot of conflicting objectives there and trying to reconcile those in a way suddenly he has hands and he has feet and he has eyes which are people and how does he use those in a way to further the objectives that he has and 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 the little nuances in in the voice the inflection it really has brought that out so modus doesn't eat except for data so if modus was going to have a pet that he would have the protectrons take care of for him what would he have as a pet i i feel like it would be on brand for modus to have a fetch collectron as a pet <laughs> That is just. There you go. I, you know what? I can't even deny that. That is very on brand for Modus. What about That's one of those mechanical cats? Ooh, the mechanical oh, cat. Yeah, yeah. 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 That would you be perfect. You can have both. And then, like, program them to be cats and dogs and see what happens when they interact. <laughs> yeah. Lots of uh, lot, cats and dogs living together. Mass Another hysteria. thing. Yeah. No, that's awesome. So we'll roll over to, to, to Lucy. So give us your insight into uh, into auditioning for and becoming Lilith. Um, okay, so I was in one of the, one of many discords. <laughs> I can't even remember. And I think it was when we were in the we we're in the um, the writers group, and that's kind of how I first got in contact with you because I do all the script writing and screenwriting and stuff for you know for the for the Fallout Five O and all the mission lore and all that stuff. So I was in there for that and for the the Scald stories that I write. Um, and I think I was like proofing something of yours or was looking at something of yours or I can't even remember. And, and Kenneth was like, hey, you should think about <clears throat> auditioning for this. And I was like, well, all right, okay. Um, because all I had done at that point was just either characters for our you know, Machinima or um, the the two characters I play in in his in Kenny's podcast. But so yeah, I just kind of I read through it. I chatted with you a little bit about kind of the back history of who she was, where she came from, to really understand what um, what I was monologuing about in the um, in that first episode where you see her. And I was like, oh, I. I can do this. I I have this voice that I use occasionally when I role play because I role play you know live in '76 and other other game other games, so I just do a wealth of just different voices and what happened. I was like, oh, I haven't done this voice in a while. I really feel that this might work. And ironically, the that that character that I would be RPing, her name was actually Lilith in the game, so it was kind of crazy. I don't know one of those weird happenstances. So yeah, I just tossed you some lines and you were like i'll get back to you and i was like all right I, you know i just really didn't expect anything of it because you know as pointed out you know i'm not doing this for for pay you know and i don't really ever really want that i think that this is just a fun thing to do for me i just really enjoy it and so when i have an opportunity to to get asked to voice something for me it's like hooray my inner thespian is just like yay so yeah, I just kind of reached it, reached for it, and embraced um, the you know the inner <laughs> Lilith and all her her gory, not her glory, but all her gory, mm -hmm. and uh, just kind of went from there. And um, yeah, so and, and I've I've had a great time actually voicing her. She's she's a lot of fun. I do have to definitely um do a few takes because she has such a distinct cadence that i have to make sure that i'm not um losing because if i do it too long for a stretch it starts to it starts to tax like you know the cadence starts to tax so um i do a lot of practicing in the shower of all places <laughs> because awesome. nobody can hear me <laughs> there you go and i and i have to say I give so much credit to people that do this all the time because when I have to read all the narration lines, the blooper reel that I could create would make a sailor blush because you get like <laughs> three quarters of the way through a paragraph yeah. because because I will say for you guys, you guys for the most part have very distinct individual lines. I can have like an entire page worth of narration that I have to read and you get three quarters of the way through and then you screw up and you're like, <laughs> um, yeah but uh no totally yeah, appreciate we it. all so, have one of those times in the mm -hmm. reading the script 
Oh yeah, AJ is the AJ is definitely the worst, and he includes all of his bloopers in oh, his lines. Oh, see, his I don't. <laughs> I don't include all the bloopers. All this, the all this reason, reason why I do that is because Lawrence does so much work on the podcast to begin <laughs> with. He deserves a laugh. Thanks. Nice. Nice. Uh, yeah, I, I had somebody. One, I had somebody did this. Rob actually did this for something that he sent to me, and in the middle of it, he said. God, I hate this character so much. <laughs> <laughs> so I with actually Lola... have some some blooper oh. reels saved, but I don't think that I've actually um, given them to anyone. I, I was I was doing it a lot in the beginning, and then I was like, "This is a lot of work." <laughs> <laughs> so so kind of to wrap up, Lola. So what would be? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I I hesitate to even ask this question. You what do you think before? Lola's favorite food uh, would be? I... I mean, do I have to pick, or can I just say how I like it prepared? Damn it, because little, let's... let's be honest, I like it raw. <laughs> Whatever it I, is. <laughs> whatever. Th no, that's true. That's true. And and to be fair, I have a Lilith camp in uh, on my Lilith character that literally has a menu of like. Tom, Dick, and Harry prepared <laughs> prepared different ways. Tried to stay in character. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's true. Like, she prefers raw, I think, um, with, like, a dash of, like, fear. And uh, <laughs> she's good to go. Uh, so, as far as a pet, I could definitely see Lilith with a pet, but certainly not one that anybody would want to get anywhere near. Right, so, right. I mean, so based you, off of the art, obviously, I mean, I totally am down for her with the two, the the two mutant hounds makes the most sense. And she'd probably name them something really ridiculous too. Um, if I, but, if I had to pick two names for those, uh, for those mutant hounds, I just call them <laughs> Billy and Betty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She it would just, yeah. I think that they suit her that that one that one piece of artwork is just so fitting for her and it really does make sense especially given like just the the actual physiology of of what she is who she is that the those those animals would would listen to her as much as a mutant hound would um listen so it makes perfect sense that she'd have two she may have more she may have a whole pack and you guys don't even know it and then you know you know, when she says she's going out for takeout, um, you know, it's it's a little <laughs> bit more than just, you know, that. <laughs> no, that's Very great. Harley Quinn having yeah, like, the two. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, I mean, I, I so when I picked, so kind of going a little bit deeper into Lilith, so when I picked kind of who I would use for the inspiration, I mean, Harley Quinn is obviously, I, I think, maybe a little cliche, she actually, I think, leans a little bit more towards the Joker, which is mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. the actual like really in depth psychosis, but mm -hmm. match that with incredible intellect, because yeah. she's you know because what doesn't come out and and I think we'll see this more in the future and this isn't a spoiler, is that Lilith is actually incredibly smart you know genius level and above, the psychosis part of that is of course the cannibalism, but when she applies that intellect to what she's doing is when she truly becomes scary. Um, not that she isn't already horrifying, because I think that anybody that, that listens to the podcast would know that she's absolutely horrifying. But I actually, and that's one of the reasons why I think your voice was so perfect, because it shows that bleeding edge between the psychosis of her personality, but then also that everything she says is done with such an intellectual, like like it's a it's almost like a dagger that she's just picking every word and every syllable for a specific reason and so that's again kind of speaking more to your to the way that you have portrayed the character oh thank you yeah when i read her backstory and especially like if people go back and listen to that first episode where she appears or the bedtime story i mean you can't miss that intellect because she's like 16 and doing all these things and you realize that even before she was like 16 17 18 she was she had already figured everything out like and she just kind of did a fairly fairly great job at convincing everybody certain things and like that that intellect was obviously there and then and then it was just unleashed and <laughs> <laughs> yes and you know. she's very and she's very very hungry she uh, is she's always hungry <laughs> yes 
Yes. So with that, so we'll, we're gonna we're gonna kind of wrap up this character study with uh, with AJ and Stein. So kind of give us a little bit of the backstory there. So a little bit of a backstory onto the creation of Stein. Uh, Stein was pretty much like an inspiration of uh, my kind uh, my kind of a transition a transition in uh, twenty in twenty twenty pandemic was basically a fish out of the water moment where it was just like um i'm in a i'm in a i'm in a location where what what am i what am i doing like how did i get here that's uh, that sort of thing and stein in this case is kind of is kind of what i wanted the sole survivor from fallout 4 to be in in the sense that you're in the sense that this he's a man out, he's a man out of time and we never really got much of a sense of that in fallout 4 but when it came to him like um you know 16 years uh, he uh, his his time is his time was gone now he's dealing with basically kids in uniform in uniforms all like all the time and one of the, and one of the things that i can definitely say when it comes to him is that like some of the reasons for why he sticks around is because like he wanted to be a family man it, like he was always pushing for things that want that he wanted the most out of but the uh, consequences such as um uh the bedtime story uh, the bed his bedtime story as uh, led to believe it all blew up it blew up uh, way out of proportion I, I will say i could not have come up with a better character than stein to act as kind of a pivot point in in the story of the modus files it has been an honor actually to write for that character because it has allowed me to tie him to Valeria and to Lilith and even to Modus in a way that I never originally planned and it has created I think a much larger story and and actually just being able to bounce off bounce ideas off of you around Stein and across and of course everyone else has allowed this story to grow far beyond what was originally intended so you know, I, I again, kudos to you and kudos to everybody else here. What I can what I can say, especially in this behind the behind the bunker things, what started originally as a joke uh, when I was starting to listen to more of like the backstory of Valeria and Lilith is that um, uh, Stein has this uh, habit of adopting a lot of like um, uh, a lot of like the youths and like and like the uh, bunker as like his children. And Valeria, Valeria and Lilith are, uh, are started out as like a, his first his first kids his first adopted adopted daughters because like um he you know like as like the family man sort of thing he kind of feels responsible for all of them and like as the only survivor of the original enclave that's left in Appalachia like he's now put in like a position where he never saw himself as like a leader or like an officer or anything like that he was just like. He's just like get the get everything done. Cool. So as far as Stein's favorite food, Stein uh, Stein's favorite food. When you see the when you see the old man, uh, you got You got to think steak and mash. Like uh, he's very he's very like um basic uh, basic that way. He he enjoys his steaks rare, and that's and like that's one thing that he and Lilith could probably get along with. Though <laughs> Lilith will never see it see her meat touch the grill. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> I was gonna say with the with the chainsaws in the game now, chainsaw flamer, she can actually cook the meat as she's uh -huh. uh, I mean, as she's sawing it down. If you use an unlit grill to bludgeon something to death, then <laughs> that counts, right? <laughs> a flaming shish kebab sword. I mean, I feel like. Oh you know... no! Oh, we got we got to write this for an episode. <laughs> Please, I already have too many plot points. I got to run out. <laughs> maybe maybe the Christmas episode. Um, and then, of course, I, you and I have already discussed kind of who, what we think Stein's pet would be, but but please feel free to kind of. Oh yeah, if he was the, if he was to have a pet, like um, both Lawrence and I came came up with the idea of him having a Saint Bernard, because the Aww. Saint Bernard, is, especially when especially when you look at the face, it's like a old mo old mopey and tired. And what is it that usually when you see like the old man, if he's not doing anything, he's sometimes like um resting on a couch, and I imagine. The Saint Bernard, as big as it is, is just like I'm laying uh, laying down the top of him, and he's just like holding it close, like a uh, like a like a big old stuffed animal. Aww, Aww. that's perfect. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Fire Rider, and I'm the host of The Pixel People, a podcast dedicated to taking a close look at our favorite characters from our favorite video games. From major characters who define the course of a game's storyline, to smaller characters who you might have never noticed. Every week, we go beyond the quest line to examine a particular character's story arc and choices, and discover the real-world parallels and life lessons hidden just below the surface. I hope you'll join us. You can find the Pixel People on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. I originally had planned for us to talk about a whole bunch of other stuff. I'm I'm actually looking at the time and knowing that I want to try to keep this down. Um, I also know that several members of our cast have uh, have things that they need to get to tonight. Um, So... Actually, I'm going to dive right into, does anybody have a favorite episode that they'd like to kind of highlight um, or just a overall highlight of kind of working on the modus files? Anything that you'd like to kind of just mention really, really quickly? Oh, yes, please. Um, <clears throat> so my my favorite my favorite episode um, remains um, uh, the Battle of the Bog, uh, which was. Oh, that was, uh, I think, episode 15. 16. Yeah, 15. 15, 15 of season one. Um, Um, both because in general, like, um, you know, Lawrence went all out on the production, um, just, you know, the effects and the, the immersion. And it was just like, it was, it, it was, it sounded like listening to it after it was all put together, it sounded suitably epic for, you know, for what it was portraying. Um, but also that's my favorite episode because it contains my favorite scene, which is Lilith in the tank. Oh God! Yeah. I just I mean, <laughs> when again. I saw the script. When I saw the script, I'm like, Oh my God! Again, this is you. I, again, <laughs> like a lot of like a lot of things that involves between Stein uh, between Stein and like uh, his interactions. I it starts out as jokes, but eventually, but eventually, like oh. Lawrence and I flesh them out to the point where it, it's it's now canon in the story. God, Lola? yes, it was so good. Yeah. Yeah. Lola, get out of the tank. No, no, Lola, get out of the tank. No, I'm in a tank and you're not. Yeah, yeah, you're not, exactly. You're not my it's dad. Not Never, Lola, get out of the tank. I am your dad. Well, not <laughs> technically speaking, just get out of the damn tank. <laughs> oh man. So, Brad, do you have a uh, do you have a favorite episode by chance? That was actually the one that I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I like. I I don't do epic myself. So I always like to hear other people do epic, <laughs> uh, and but but really the Battle of the Bog was was the episode that I had that I had kind of uh, uh, thought of when I when I saw this this question put up. So I, uh, I I I concur with Dora on this one. What about you, Mandy? Was there a uh, was there a favorite episode of yours by chance? Um, well, definitely Battle of the Bog was fantastic, um, but I do have a favorite. It was Night Stalker from season one. Oh, um, yeah. That was my last episode, but it was just, I loved that Valeria was going and facing her fears and overcame them. And that was just such a cool thing to get to portray. And that, I really liked that episode. Now, I, I will say if I can, if I can circle back, I, I, I thought about the question in two different ways. One of them was my favorite episode, just generally speaking, is what I, what was the most enjoyable episode to listen to. But selfishly, I think the, the episode that I enjoyed doing the most was the one where I got to play Lilith's father, uh, not the bedtime story. I mean, the bedtime story was was fun to do too, but the one where we were revisiting via the the hollow tapes, what you know, going into Lilith's uh, origin story. That was a lot of fun because I don't I don't play heel very often, and that was a a very meaty bad guy role that you, you can i mean i i felt like i should grow a mustache just to twirl it you know he's like like the, like the, like if i had to be Hunter completely S- honest the way brad was voice was voicing lilith's father he he kind of reminded me of a james bond villain uh well the, the thing hunter s thompson once was talking about george hw bush and he compared and contrasted him to richard nixon and he said that nixon was so aggressively evil that he practically glowed at night and that was that was how I pictured Lilith's father. Like he's he's that level of evil. But it's it's almost the the, the matter of factness and the banality of evil in that he it's not even that he doesn't think he's doing anything wrong. Like he knows what he's doing is wrong. 
but he's so matter of fact about it that there's a special uh, there there's a it's 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 a particular type of evil that's very interesting to uh uh to explore so so yeah for just from a from a performer perspective that was that was fun because i got to sort of step out of my comfort zone a little bit and do something that i don't get a chance to do people generally cast me in uh you know good guy roles or positions of authority but good guy positions of authority so having the opportunity to be a to be a really good mustache twirling bad guy was uh it, it was it was fun and then of course i got to revisit it in the in the bedtime story too yeah well and and i think ultimately i live by the maxim that every villain is the hero of their own story because whether you're a hero or a villain becomes a matter of perspective and the fallout universe is nothing if not incredibly gray you know people that you would view as heroes have a lot of character flaws and people that are villains actually do sometimes show sparks of kindness and mercy and the whole purpose of the modus files is to tell a story around a faction who in general fallout views as the mustache twirling villains and it's important that these characters actually be shown as real people and real people do both horrible things and they are terrifying but they also do you know acts of mercy and they can be good so in all of this these characters go through multiple journeys and what you guys have been able to do with them is is quite actually incredible um i only put words on a page it is the individuals on this podcast, along with the multiple upon multiple other individuals who have been part of the cast here, who bring these characters to life and make this as a something that I believe the community has really adopted. And I will say, too, that I never expected it to become this, but I am dedicated to seeing this story through to the end. And the great thing is, is that I'm looking at multiple potential episodes after this whole series ends so additional stories of lilith and colonel and everything else that that is there's a huge amount of potential out there and i really want to see as much of this kind of put out there as 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 possible i was um, gonna say like if i could just like interject later. yeah please do okay i was just gonna say that when you were talking about the you know these are bad guys but they're also people like you and i have had conversations behind the scenes about lilith because she she is the sort of character that she is. And I was like, you know, there are these moments in um, certain certain episodes where there are there is a time where you get to see pieces of that small shred of humanity. So like when, when thinking about like favorite episodes, um, so I can't like necessarily pinpoint one. It's more like whenever she demonstrates those really rare moments, like when she actually felt a little bit bad about killing her mother you know that her mom was caught in the whole situation or when valeria which she wasn't sure if valeria was going to make it like the this the kind of the 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 way that she handled that um that moment was a sense of a, a bit of a weakness for her in that she realizing you know she's realizing that the like one person who's kind of been there for her you know may not be there kind of a deal um and then you know so those those moments for lilith i think are some of my favorite selfishly maybe but but just because she is you know she's a she's a she is the kind of the kind of character she is she's she's a violent um you know violent person who enjoys torture and eating <laughs> eating her her people so when you have those moments i think it's really important for her but also like when you see it as well. So if I if I could also just pinpoint a specific episode, then I guess maybe I also really liked just um when Stein was doing the Christmas episode. Mm -hmm. Because I thought it was oh. just a really it was it was different and it's intended to be different because of when it, you know, when it was falling, it was kind of a special episode. But again, it taps into that they all they all have these like you know, they're rooted in these these kind of I don't want to say nefarious, but they they are who they are in in this podcast. But then they have these situations where, for one moment, you get to see this other side of them, and so they're not consistently, as as Brad said, the mustache twirling villain. You have this this aspect of humanity, and so anytime that kind of happens, I I really enjoy um, hearing that and, and and kind of envisioning what that looks like. 
Yeah. And, and it's been important to me to allow all of these characters to act like human beings, because I think that even as we look at our lives, there are opportunities for us to show different sides of ourselves. And, you know, the Valeria, I think, is a great example of this, is that someone who from a very young age was taught one certain thing and who is trying to be that beacon of authority. But then she's faced with, hey, I might actually have found somebody that I love. Like, this is an emotion that I don't know how to deal with. How does how do we explore that? And how does that come out in the story? And what does that mean for her? Um, same thing for Stein. You know, Stein is going to go through, is going through a metamorphosis. He's He is one thing, but maybe he's another. Modus, same thing. And I mean, all of these characters, I think, can really... Uh, show a lot of different signs, and I think it brings a lot of, of texture to the story. With that, I, I really, my wrap-up is this has been a great opportunity. This is the first time I've actually had everybody, um, all of the main cast members together. Um, we're having the opportunity to see each other. We're doing this as a special episode for the community. This will be released on National Podcast Day, but we really want this, I want this, and I hope we all want this, to kind of stand as a insight into who we are what we do why we're doing it and our pledge that we will continue to do this and we want to show and tell a really great story um, that's really kind of my exit to this uh, as the operative um, i invite you all down to the white spring we have plenty of old possum and blackwater brew um, we'll put some mole rat on the fire for you maybe some uh, roasted death claw if uh, lilith will share any um, but with that, is there, I actually want to give everyone else kind of the opportunity to give your kind of wrap up and conclusion to all of this, and then uh, we will let you all go. So let's start with, uh, with Mandy. What would you like to, to kind of leave as a, as a final thought? Um, well, I would like to thank you for oh. writing this amazing story and letting us all be a part of it because it has truly been an awesome ride, and I'm looking forward to where it's going. Um, so thank you for that. You know, same to everyone else. Like you all do such amazing work on these characters, bringing them to life, and um, I'm just very honored to be a part of it. Awesome. And Dora. Um. Well, I just. Uh. Yeah. I. I. I have to say, it's. It's weird just thinking about it. Like the. That this is. This is such a. Part of my life now, right? And this is like this is literally the second voice acting gig that I got at all, and the other one was like a one line role in a student film. Like, it was, it's it's weird. Like this is a, this is a real thing, right? Like it's it's making me feel, it, it's 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 imposter syndrome armor, right? Because like because you do such a great job and it's such a great production, um, but also really just to thank. Um, all of the fans and the people who listen to the podcast like wow thank you for for actually um for actually tuning in and um and that's an old person phrase that we don't use for podcasts but i'm sorry <laughs> um but but yes uh it's uh because obviously i mean to, let's be fair we would probably still be doing this if no one was listening but <laughs> it's it's very nice that people are so thank you awesome brad well, I mean, obviously, I, I owe a great personal debt to you, um, and I won't break into song, but you opened up a whole new world uh, that I didn't think I was going to regain entry to. Uh, you know, I left the, the entertainment industry about 25 years ago and basically just gave up on the idea of doing anything, even even in, you know, a fan production that is not, you know, not paid and not SAG work. Um, but... I don't know what inspired me to respond to your Reddit post, but I'm glad I did. And, you know, you have been a great mentor to me. You have been an inspiration. You have been an outstanding collaborator. You have been a great friend. You have been somebody who has helped me in myriad ways, both on a professional level as well as on a personal level. So I have a great deal of personal gratitude to you for for all the things that you have done for me. And I realize how selfish that sounds, but that's that's something that I think is top of mind. And I think that the people that listen to the Modus Files should know and and really understand and appreciate the quality of the person who's the, the, the creative driving force behind it. Because that's something that 
a lot of times I, I don't think people get visibility into. They consume the product, they enjoy the product, but they don't get to see all these things that kind of happen in the background. So, you know, shining a light on that in, in whatever way that light can be shined, I think is is a good thing to do. And this, I think, is a good opportunity to do that. And I hope that a lot of people are listening and are still listening at this point in it so that they can hear this part because it's the kind of thing that people that, that, that people need to know. Um, I'm doing things now that I two years ago never in my wildest dreams would have thought that I was doing or that I would be doing and I am and it's because of you oh. that's and that's not overstating it that's that's you 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 got me going in this thing again you kept me going and along the way um even so many you know practical pieces of support that you gave me in terms of you know feedback on writing or suggestions or bringing in cast members for for my show all of these things and then when you add in the emotional support that you gave me a great personal cost to yourself giving of yourself in a way that was maybe not the best thing for you at the time but you didn't worry about that at the time um all those things are the kinds of things that 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 people remember when you do those kinds of things for them and i i there's no way that i can say enough words or do enough deeds or whatever to to pay it back or even to pay it forward but what i can do is i can try to be the best version of myself both both to myself and to everybody that i work with that i interact with uh, because you have set that kind of example for for how somebody should conduct themselves in this space. So everybody who's listening, everybody who listens to the show, this is the kind of person that's that's behind this right now. He's not just a, a creative genius. He's not just a, a a great logistical person who can wrangle all this all this complicated stuff together. He's he's a, he's a great guy, and wow. that can't be. That can't be said enough, and I know that everybody who's who's in this conference, and I know that everybody who couldn't be here, and all the people that have worked on it, or who have worked on other projects with you, or just been in the same community as you, would echo that sentiment if they were here. So, Aww. thank you, and uh, you know what what can I say? I, I I used to be a writer, but I don't I don't have the the words to uh, to appropriately express it. So I hope that I that I communicated it at least in, in, in some small way. So, so thank you is the best way that I can put it. Oh, well, thank you, Brad. Really. I mean, I, from the heart, I, I so appreciate that. And, and again, none of this would be possible without all of you or the community, Lucy. Gosh, Brad, how do I follow that? <laughs> Man. Oh, no. Um, I'm just going to echo what, what's been said and, and thank you for, one for trusting us, you know, um, you know, when you decided to give us all the different, uh, the different opportunities and just trusting us to kind of roll with, um, helping you also to develop a kind of a living version of what's inside, you know, your head as it's spinning around, but also, um, to, to echo just, um, your, your generosity your generosity of spirit and friendship and, um, and all the kind of the things that go in between, you know, that are, you know, spoken and unspoken. And I think that that's really something that um, people don't necessarily understand if they're not part of a production, like what ends up kind of happening between the cast and crew, that it really does become like a little, um, you know, a little family, a little nuclear family of, of individuals that, um, you know, talk to each other, share with each other, get to know each other. I mean, just because we don't say the lines together, as you were talking about earlier, um, we've we've heard each other over and over again. That now it gets to the point that we kind of know how the you know how the conversation would sound if we were in the room, and that's a testament to kind of you bringing us all together and and kind of creating this this little pocket, you know, universe family that we have here um, of individuals where 
you em you embrace um, our own interpretations and our own creativity, and it's never just what does you know what do what does I, you know I want to do this and I want to do that, and it's only going to be my way. And it's never been like that. And I obviously I don't think it will ever be like that. And I think that's what really gives um, you know your story so much life is your passion for it and also your your capacity to listen for it as well. And so just yeah, so just thanks for for trusting us and inviting us in and then um, you know letting us just be weird with you. That's awesome. AJ, take us home. <laughs> oh man, how oh man, how can I um uh how can I step nope, up? Nope, step no, up pre to play no pressure, with this? AJ. No pressure. No, no, no. <laughs> don't, None, don't, no pressure. Don't, don't, don't screw uh, it one, up. The one th the one thing that I can definitely say, especially with all the uh, with all the cast and uh especially with you, Lawrence, I just I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to bring uh, to bring a um, uh, to bring a character that was just like um at first just a bunch of like rand uh, like random stories like jumbled uh, jumbled up into one to life uh thank you uh, thank you all uh, thank you all for uh just being part of this wacky crate uh, wacky crazy um uh, cast uh, cast family bringing a story to life in a um uh, ga in a game which it felt empty at first, but now is coming more and more fleshed out. Uh, and I want to, uh, I want to like uh, pray and hope for everyone's future endeavors and like both this podcast as well as well as uh, all other future uh, future projects. And um, what more, what more can I say this than a great than a great quote, especially when it comes to stories like the podcast. A world without stories is nothing but empty space, and it takes us to start writing them out. That's awesome, and I will. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> it's like Dad telling a story. <laughs> <laughs> so it has been an honor and a pleasure to work with all of you and the entire community. The Modus Files will continue. We have many, many more stories to tell. Um, this is an awesome community. We enjoy uh, supporting it. As part of that support, um, we will be announcing our giveaway. Uh, we created. Uh, the vault University hat from the Fallout, Fallout 76 game. We will be um, selecting six random winners. Um, so go to our Twitter. Uh, we're at Modus Files, M-O-D-U-S-F-I-L-E-S. -E um, and like, retweet, and follow us. Um, we have a post up there. And you can enter into winning one of those hats. We will announce the winners on, the on well, actually today when this releases. Um, I say this now, of course. But thank you to all of our subscribers and supporters. This has become so much bigger than any of us ever expected. You are what drive us. This story belongs to everyone. And this will stand the test of time because we have poured our heart and souls into it. God bless America. God bless the Enclave. And we'll see you in the next episode. Now thank you very and much. forever. <laughs> Thanks. Members. We look forward to your next visit to our little enclave.